Uh, Beatrice and Virgil is about a writer who meets a taxidermist who's been working on a play for many, many years. And that's why he writes to the writer, because he needs his help. And so the two of them um, are at a loss for words, because the writer has stopped writing, and the taxidermist is stuck. And the, the novel is essentially about their relationship. And the taxidermist is quite an ambiguous figure. He's quite an unpleasant character, actually. He's not very giving. He's not very polite. In fact, he's borderline rude. Um, but his play intrigues uh, uh, Henry, the writer. He's intrigued by the play because it reminds him of the Holocaust. And he'd been writing a book on the Holocaust, which wasn't published and ultimately led him to stop writing. And so he thinks the play is about the Holocaust, but, he, but the taxidermist says that, no, it's about the environment. And so he, he's kind of puzzled. So it's about, it's, the, it's about their relationship. Beatrice and Virgil was inspired by uh, a long-term interest I've had in the Holocaust. Now, I have to say, I, I stand completely outside of that drama. I'm not Jewish. I'm not of Eastern European descent. Uh, I'm of French-Canadian descent, but my family's been in Quebec for over 300 years. So I'm a complete, complete outsider to the tragedy. And yet it's always interested me, um, not just as a citizen, but also as an artist. And that was the real challenge, is how can I comment on the Holocaust, on this event which is so strongly identified with a particular group, if I'm not a member of that group? Um, and it took me years and years to, to, to uh, for years I just circled around it. I was always interested. I read the books on it, uh, saw the movies, visited Auschwitz. Um, and then one day I went to a show of prints by the Spanish artist Francisco Goya, which featured animals. Now, I'd already finished Life of Pi, so it'd be odd that I didn't think about it beforehand. But seeing those prints um, suddenly made me think, well, what if I try to discuss the Holocaust using this, ob using this obviously literary ploy of talking animals? That would be a very different way to discuss it. That would allow me, if I'm not Jewish, I can't approach it in human disguise, but maybe if I don the costume of a monkey and a donkey, because after all, Beatrice is a donkey, Virgil is a monkey. That's the way I can come. It's so obvious that I'm not trying to pretend to be anything else. In Beatrice and Virgil, their readers might think that it's autobiographical because there is this writer named Henry who's written a book that's done very well that features animals. Um, it l sounds like autobiography, but it's only there because it served my purpose. It helped me tell my story. So I wanted to feature a writer because I wanted to talk about something that's so hard to write about, talk about, the Holocaust. This writer, Henry, stops writing, and that was useful for me too because most people say of the Holocaust that it robs them of their words, it robs them of their tongue, they are silenced. And also the other main character, the taxidermist, also is having difficulty expressing himself. His, his play has been working on for years, it isn't working, he's stalled on it. So to have two characters who who, are, uh, uh, who, who cannot speak, who are silent, suited my purpose. And the other characteristics that Henry has, people also might think they're autobiographical. Autobiographical, they're not. So for example, Henry plays the clarinet, I don't. He's an amateur actor, I am not. I put those in there because I wanted Henry to be a stand-in for Europe's Jews. I'm trading on positive generalizations here in this book. So um, the Jews of Europe famously were very involved in the arts and sciences, which is why I have Henry be uh, a, a, a musician and an amateur actor. Uh, the Jews of Europe were often very multi were multilingual. They spoke, you know, they would speak Hebrew if they were religious, they would speak Yiddish, and they'd speak the local vernacular, if not, and possibly another language. Henry is also multilingual, which happens also to be my case. I use animals in my fiction. Uh, or did in Life of Pi and, and do in, in Beatrice and Virgil because I find them very effective in telling a story. We tend to be very cynical about our own species, but less so about wild animals. And so as soon as you have a novel that features a wild animal, I've noticed, or I, I started noticing with Life of Pi, that readers start to suspend their disbelief. They, they open themselves up, and that's of course very useful for a storyteller. Because um, once you get readers suspending their disbelief, then you can start telling your story. Half the battle is, uh, of the indifference of the reader is won. So, uh, and also I just find animals interesting. I find their metaphorical potential infinite. And also, the last reason is very few people in adult fiction use animals. For some reason, we seem to confine animals to children's literature. And that puzzles me, because I don't know what's childish about a tiger or what's childish about a, about a monkey. So there's a nice feeling I have of being alone in my field. I'm not crowded out by uh, dozens of other writers. Uh, in the novel, there's the, the Holocaust uh, appears in it, and so does uh, the destruction of animals. And I put those in parallel 
because both are holocaustal. The Holocaust obviously is holocaustal by, by definition, but I think the destruction of the environment echoes that too. And in a sense, that's what I'm trying to do with this novel, is, uh, is, is broaden the application that we might make of the Holocaust. Of course, it's a unique historical event that's, that's quite easily established, um, but I think we nonetheless have to apply it, because it's in applying it that we can compare and contrast and, and refine our thinking of things. And uh, our rapid destruction of the environment, you know, every year species disappear, um, approaches the kind of holocaust that the Jews of Europe uh, suffered. Life of Pi was inspired by a number of things. Uh, a review I read of a Brazilian novel uh, quite a lot while ago, a trip to India, a fatigue with being reasonable, um, uh, but the main thing I'd say would be India. I, I happened to be in India, it was the second time, I was just backpacking. I meant to be working on a novel set in Portugal. It didn't come alive, and so I set it aside. And I, I, I thought of this idea of a boy in a lifeboat with an animal. And it all came together, one of those magical alchemical moments where these disparate elements come together and you suddenly... So I saw the whole novel very quickly, this idea of a, a set of facts and two stories. Um, and then I proceeded to do research in India and then research at home in Montreal. I was grateful for the success of Life of Pi, um, but it ne didn't change much uh, as far as I'm concerned as a writer. Uh, uh, even before Life of Pi, I was writing what I wanted to write. Um, that's what you do in literary fiction. You write what you want to write, and most of the time you write maybe good novels, but they don't sell. I was lucky with Life of Pi that it sold very well. I'm totally excited that Life of Pi is going to be adapted to the screen. Um, Ang Lee is supposed to direct. Uh, he's an incredible director. Uh, Brokeback Mountain, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, you know, The Ice Storm, one great movie after another. Uh, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled. Uh, I've read the screenplay. It's a very good screenplay. It's not obvious taking a 320-page novel and boiling it down to a screenplay of 120 pages or so, uh, but he's managed to pull it off. I don't know how my writing style has changed. I guess it has. Uh, hopefully I'm better at it. Um, I don't write very much. I'm 46 and I've been writing full time since I was roughly 26. And I've only done four books, so God knows what I've been doing all that time. But uh, I do it slowly, carefully. Each book is for me a way to investigate some question I'm interested in. So in Life of Pi, I was interested in looking at faith and factuality, faith and science, faith and reason. In Beatrice and Virgil, I was interested in looking at the great, great tragedy and what art, how art can deal with mass murder. What, what can the artist do? The, the, we know what the historian can do. We know what the witness can do. But what does the artist, the person who specializes in inventing tales who are, that are not factually true but hopefully are spiritually true, what does that person do f confronted with something like the Holocaust? I'm very excited about my next book. It will feature three chimpanzees and it will be set in Portugal. It'll be a novel divided into three parts, three distinct parts, and each one will feature a chimpanzee. And what I want to look at is the role of teachers in our lives, um, all forms of teachers, so gurus, all kinds of leaders, teachers, mentors, uh, our relationship with them, and then what we do when they go away. I hope readers who've read Beatrice and Virgil will be moved. A work of art doesn't work if it doesn't move you at some level. Um, but I also hope that at uh, another level they'll be stimulated intellectually. One of the things I was trying to do with Beatrice and Virgil is look at the Holocaust in a different way, not look at it in the way we usually look at it, which is a very historical, testimonial way, full of facts and historical locations. That's obviously necessary. We need to know what happened before we can start understanding it. But at one point I think we need the understanding of art. We need to understand it through that part of us that understands through the imagination. And so we need to apply the tools of art to the Holocaust, which hasn't been done. I mean, it's been done recently. It's starting, you know, Jonathan Safran Foer, David Grossman. You know, people have started approaching it somewhat differently. So I'm hoping pe people who read Beatrice and Virgil will be struck by the very end of it, for example, the games for Gustav, which uh, games for Gustav will make sense once you read it. But see, those to me are a, an ahistorical encapsulation of the Holocaust. They take the Holocaust and they, get to its, they go to its essence. Um, you have this, these, the, you know, the Holocaust reduced to these very simple situations. So that hopefully you'll read those and you'll remember what it was like for Jews 70 years ago in Europe, but without having to go through that usual historical route full of details. Um, so as I said, I hope that readers who read Beard and Virgil will be moved and hopefully provoked to think too.